Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our international webinar uh, on the agroecology and community. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I will be the moderator for today. Uh, my name is Elisa Azura Azmat. I'm from University Putra, Malaysia, and also with the SRIMAS. And on top of that, I am the chairman of the, uh, this international webinar. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, for your information, the webinar series uh, aims to promote agroecological approaches for sustainable agriculture with related topics presented by local and international speakers. This is a monthly event to raise awareness on agroecology and explore community practices globally. So for today, we are privileged to have the speaker where have, he has spent a lot of time related to uh, SRI, system rice in intensification. So our speaker today is Prof. Emeritus Dr. Norman Apo. Okay, so before that, I would like to uh, give some uh, brief information about our speaker today. Uh, Norman Apoff is a professor emeritus of government and uh, international agriculture, where he has been on the faculty since 1970. From 1990 to 2005, he served as director of the Cornell International Institute for Food, Agriculture and Development, during which time he learned about the system of rice intensification development in Madagascar. So for today, uh, Prof will uh, share with us about uh, SRI and also SCI. Okay, I, uh, Prof give me uh, some, yeah, uh, a, a bit more uh, explanation about uh, him, but I think when I see on the slide, uh, it's okay, I will leave it to the Prof to explain more about what is SRI, the component of SRI. Okay, some of us today might know what is SRI, what is SCI, but some of us might, might um, still not clear about what is it. Okay, all right, Prof. The format today is we will have the presentations from the uh, our speaker about maybe 30 to 40 minutes. All right. After that, we will have the QA session and also the discussion. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you can uh, put the question in the chat box. I will, I will pick the question and give to the prof. For your information, we also live through our Facebook, uh, Three Mass Facebook, and also through our uh, YouTube, Three Mass uh, Society YouTube. So our repertoire for today is Miss Putri Dini to uh, write the report for the webinar today. So I think I would like to invite Prof, Prof Norman to give um, his speech or his sharing today. Please, Prof. Okay, I will share the slide. Okay, well, thank you very much, Eliza, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, when I got the invitation from Eliza, my one hesitation about agreeing was that I knew the group would be very diverse. Some like Anizan and Anil and others have been really working with SRI for many years. And some of them will know more about certain aspects than I will. At the same time, we'll hopefully be attracting some new interest to SRI. So I recognize it's a very uh, broad audience. I will say enough to introduce the subject, but I'm really trying to get a, what we should understand are the ultimately the principles and even the philosophy which underlie uh, SRI and the system of crop intensification. Uh, I haven't really spoken much about, or even thought much about the philosophy, but for this, I had to try to distill our main philosophical uh, premises or assumptions. So I'll do with that next. Just a bit of historical background. As uh, Liza mentioned, SRI was developed in Madagascar by Father Henri de Lamnier. A French priest who spent 
34 years of his life living in Madagascar and over a 20 year period working with farmers and conducting his own experiments, he synthesized uh, the various practices which constitute SRI, at least initially. The basic components were assembled in 1983-84 with subsequent modifications, which I will mention, but you see it's about almost 30 years old. So it's, it's not a new innovation, but it's been a new innovation as it spreads country by country. In 1990, Father Launier with his Malagasy colleagues formed an NGO called Association Kefi And in 1994, our Institute at Cornell began working with Tefi Asina under a USAID project in Madagascar to uh, save the rainforest there. And if you were going to save the rainforest, you had to get farmers to stop entering the forest and cutting it down to do slash and burn agriculture with very poor yields, maybe one ton, sometimes a bit more, uh, but in fact, it was very destructive to the forest and required very little labor. Uh, so we had to find a way to persuade farmers to take this up. When I was first told about SRI, I couldn't believe it. Most people can't. So I waited to even talk about SRI internationally for three seasons. But in those first three seasons, working with farmers whose yields had been two tons per hectare, they had average yields of eight tons per hectare, somewhere 10, even 12, one was 14 at first year. And these are with the same rice varieties and the same very poor soils. So it was really something which just struck me. I'm a social scientist by training, as most of you know. Uh, how could farmers get four times more yield without changing varieties on soils that were demonstrably very poor uh, there was a PhD thesis done on these soils by North Carolina State University, and uh, they figured that the pH was 3.8 to 5, which is very acidic. Uh, the cation exchange capacity was low or even very low in all horizons of the soil. And most importantly, uh, the uh, available phosphorus in the soil was only uh, three to four parts per million. Now, usually agronomists say you need at least 10 parts per million to have any kind of decent crop. Here are these farmers, all very small farmers, very poor uh, on these terrible soils, getting eight tons of yield where they formerly had two. That's what got me personally involved. And I decided I needed to learn both enough French to read the priest's papers and enough agronomy so that I could explain what was going on to colleagues and to get them to try out these methods for themselves. Next. <clears throat> Next. That, so at that point, 1997, 98, 99, we began trying to get researchers and farmers in other countries to try out the methods for themselves to see if similar results could be obtained. We weren't promoting SRI because we had our own questions and reservations, but we wanted to approach very experimentally to see if other farmers in other countries could benefit from these methods. Between 19, starting in 1999-2000, uh, SRI's methods were validated outside Madagascar and China, Indonesia, Philippines, and uh, uh, Philippines, Sri Lanka, India, Cuba, Sierra Leone, Gambia. Uh, and beyond that, once SRI was spreading in many countries, farmers in India, Ethiopia, Mali, and other countries began adapting these ideas and methods to other crops, leading to what we're now calling the system of crop intensification, which includes millet in India, wheat in India, Ethiopia, Mali, sugarcane, mustard, eggplant in, in India, teff in Ethiopia, green leafy vegetables in Sierra Leone, even carrots uh, and apples in the USA. Next. This is a picture of Father Lavanier making a field visit for, shortly before he died in 1995. What you can't see in the picture is that at this point, he was suffering from very serious uh, knee problems. So it was very painful to walk. 
But even so, he got out into the field, uh, even in somewhat risky circumstances, uh, to see what was going on and to learn both from and with the farmers. Next. This is a picture that really persuaded me we had to investigate the SRI more closely because this picture was sent from Cuba in 2004. These two rice plants are the same variety and the same age. And they're even raised in the same nursery. The plant on the right had been taken out when it was only 10 days old, planted with wide spacing, uh, organic matter in the soil, soil aerating weeding. And at 52 days, the plant on the left was taken out of the nursery for transplanting, which is about the usual age for transplants in Cuba. And fortunately, our colleague, Rita Perez, Rita Perez, had a camera with her when she visited this farmer, Luis Romero, and she was able to take a picture. And this is a stunning picture, five tillers on the one plant, 43 on the other. Small gangly roots on one plant, huge, large roots on the other. And you notice the color. These are bright white roots, not the dark ones that are suffocating and dying from a conventional plant under flooded circumstances. So when I got this picture, I was quite stunned. I sent a camera to Rena so the next season, she could go out every day, every week and take pictures of the plants, the conventional plants and the SRI plants as they were growing. And so we have on our website videos uh, showing these plants as one takes off and grows so magnificently while their sister plants growing under standard conditions uh, struggle. So this was a really important picture for me. Next. These pictures were sent from rice researchers in Iran on the left and Iraq on the right. So we found even under the very different uh, agroecosystems in Iran and Iraq, that the researchers there could see the difference in the phenotype, in the physical uh, perspective, um, uh, just as a matter of growth, not of variety. Next. This is a picture by, was sent by the re researcher in Iraq. These pairs of plots are all the same variety using SRI methods on the left, standard methods, older seedlings, crowding, flooding on the right. And you see the difference, which the researchers there could see in the vigor and the growth of the rice plants simply as a matter of crop management. Next. This picture on the left is sent from Vietnam and on the right from Taiwan, showing how the SRI plants in the both cases on the left uh, withstood the force of tropical storms, the wind damage and the rain damage. Um, and this is one of the more important things because farmers are now contending with, with more severe weather events and the ability of plants to withstand the force of the wind and rain is very important for them getting a decent crop. Next. This picture on the left was given by the farmer shown on the right, Miyati Janna in Eastern Java. And uh, on the picture on the left, the left-hand field is her neighbor's plot of rice with a new brand, a new variety and using chemical fertilizer and other uh, inputs. Whereas Miati's crop on the right is uh, a traditional variety, aromatic variety of rice, uh, which she is growing with organic, fully organic SRI methods. Uh, these fields have been hit by brown plant hopper and then by a tropical storm. So the brown plant hopper turned the rice plants on the left brown, didn't really affect the ones on the right. And then the storm blew down many of the crops of crop plants on the left, but didn't harm the ones on the right. Um, Miate got an average yield of eight tons per hectare. She harvested 800 kg of uh, paddy from her thousand square uh, meters there. Farmer on the left who had spent much more on his crop had virtually no harvest. Again, this plant was a powerful uh, evidence for me and it was given to me by a farmer who I know 
who is completely honest and trustworthy. Uh, and so I wish everyone who grows rice could see this picture and this reflect on <clears throat> how you could storm proof and pest proof uh, your crop by changing management practices. Next. <clears throat> now, how is this possible? There's no magic here. It's done by creating a more conducive environment for crop growth above ground and especially below ground. SRI methods evoke more productive and robust phenotypes from any genotype, that is from any given variety. Does everyone know what phenotypes and genotypes are? I can't see all of your heads right now, so I, I'm guessing many of you would say, well, not really. The phenotype is the phenomenon. It's the actual plant that grows from the variety, which is the genotype, the genetic type. Uh, what is the genetic endowment, genetic potential? All plants of the same genotype start with the same potential, but the resulting plants are somewhat different, some better than others. And what results from that original seed is called the phenotype. And so if you put SRI into one sentence, SRI methods evoke, elicit more productive and robust phenotypes from any genotype. But anyway, <clears throat> the pictures I'm showing give more evidence of this. This explanation underlies all of agroecology whose aim is to mobilize biological processes and potentials that already exist in crop plants and in the soil system. So agroecology is a word that's now coming into vogue, becoming more popular. What is it? People often stutter or stammer on that. Again, I think you can say in just one sentence, it is a mobilizing biological processes and potentials that already exist in crop plants and in soil systems. Uh, I think this thinking can be applied also to animal husbandry. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, we had a case where farmers applied these ideas to their chicken production, which I can talk about uh, later if anyone wants to know more about that. I say, that, say this and then add, this is not to say we shouldn't be breeding improved varieties if we can. Improving the genotype means that farmers are going to have a better starting point. But in fact, what we've shown again and again with SRI is that with better management, different management, uh, we can make more improvement in crop performance uh, by the management factors that we do by improving genotype. The next. The basic or initial practices for SRI were first, start with young seedlings only eight to 12 days old, up to 15 days maybe, up until the fourth filicron of growth begins, and then transplant these young seedlings very quickly, carefully, being sure there's no root trauma. The roots remain intact, not abused, not bruised, uh, because they are really the secret to the plant's success. Transplant single plants per hill. Two plants of the soil is, is not very, is, oh, it's significant. If the soil is not very fertile, but basically a single plant per hill, and then plant them in a square pattern, 25 by 25 centimeters, <clears throat> as you see in the picture there from Sri Lanka. <clears throat> they can be, if the soil is very fertile, as in some parts of Indonesia, 30 by 30 will give you a higher yield. If soil is not very fertile, then plant them closer 20 by 20 centimeters. The point is that we want to plant optimally sparsely and reduce the plant density. The plant density is reduced with SRI by 80%, even 90%, which is why we can get better crop by reducing our seed requirements from 60, 70, 75 uh, you know, kilograms per hectare to just five, six, seven kilograms per hectare. Next. <clears throat> then no continuous flooding of the field. Keep the uh, soil mostly aerobic for the sake of the roots and for the sake of the aerobic organisms in the soil which contribute to the plant's success. Uh, use mechanical weed control, a mechanical weeder as shown here, uh, to actively aerate the soil as well as bury weeds 
into the soil as a kind of green manure. No flooding, we say, is passive soil aeration. The weeding is for active soil aeration. And you notice the farmers here, these also from Indonesia, uh, are going in, in perpendicular directions. That's why you plant in a square pattern. So you can weed in both up and down and back and forth. And that means that you're breaking up and aerating the soil all around the plant 360 degrees. And then a sixth measure is to add organic matter as much as possible in preference to fertilizer. That doesn't mean you never use fertilizer unless you've decided to grow SRI plants organically. Uh, but the point is that the organic matter doesn't just feed the plant, it also feeds the soil and makes the uh, soil more fertile. I should add that this sixth me method was not an original SRI practice. Father Lalonie started SRI using chemical fertilizer uh, like everyone else did, thinking that was the way you uh, raise yields. Then the government removed the subsidy on SRI in the late 80s, so you started using compost. And if you do all the other practices, then compost will give even better results than will uh, uh, fertilizer. So as Tefi Sina says, organic matter is an accelerator, uh, improves upon the other five. Uh, when we try to explain SRI in terms of its basic practices, I would put adding organic matter as much as possible in straight away, okay? Next. Now, it's been interesting for me to see how over the last 20 years, SRI has evolved, usually at farmer initiative, uh, beyond the initial six practices which Father Lanier developed. First of all, we now have rain-fed SRI where there's no irrigation. That means you're not control, able to control the water, uh, but you do make the best use of rainfall and you try not to hoard the water at the start of the season, as Anil knows in, in Bihar, because uh, if you flood the field at the start of the season and you set back the roots, then when the water becomes scarce later on in the growth cycle, the plant doesn't have a good root system. So rain-fed SRI is an adaptation, which is quite possible either with uh, direct seeding or with transplanting. Direct seeding in some sense seems to go against SRI, but in fact, if you direct seed, you're really taking very good care and don't disturb the roots. And direct seed can save labor, it yeah. usually doesn't give quite as high yields as transplanting, but if you save enough labor, then you know, it's a preferable method. Uh, some farmers are using mulch to control weeds rather than the push weeder. That reduces your labor costs. Uh, it doesn't give as much soil aeration but because you can't weed. On the other hand, once you get the life in the soil well built up and very active, uh, then they will you know, make the burrows and holes and channels in the soil that enable oxygen to reach the Okay, we're back, I think. Um, one of the things we've been learning lately is that the alternate wetting and drying of the soil which followed along the A recommended up through the uh, panicle initiation stage should now probably be extended to the whole cycle. Our colleague Amod Thakur in India has done a very good uh, study of this, two, two seasons uh, in Bhubaneswar. And if anyone wants to uh, have the article, just send me an email and I'll send you his article. So I think one of our next steps is in fact be recommending more clearly that the alternate wetting and drying not be stopped once the field, uh, uh, well, once the crop flowers, but rather extend up to maybe two weeks before harvesting. Uh, raised beds are being used many places in the conversions with conservation agriculture. Uh, SRI is being integrated within farming systems with fish, horticulture, mushrooms, potatoes, and other crops. And then, as I said, it's now being extended and extrapolated to other crops. So SRI is not a technology. We've said that from the start. Don't think of it like a green revolution 
technology where you have certain inputs, certain schedules, you follow them very closely as the extension agent tells you to do, but rather understand the principles behind uh, these practices and make your own adaptations. Um, and it turns out these adaptations can be adjusted and adapted uh, to producing many other crops. Next. This was a picture sent to me from uh, uh, Jharkhand in uh, India, growing finger millet. On the right is a traditional variety, local variety, grown with the usual practice of broadcasting. In the middle is a traditional variety, or just a new variety, but grown in the traditional way of broadcasting. You see, it's pretty good. You can see the benefit that having better genetic potential, a better gen genotype can make between the right-hand plant and the middle plant. But on the left hand, you see a plant where they start with the transplanted millet seedlings about 10 days old, widely spaced, and they were able to double their yields or more, even though they had many fewer plants because the plants grown that way are so much more vigorous. Next. And these are pictures sent of the difference in the size of panicle and difference in the size of roots. Again, it seems to me that tells you a lot about SRI or SCI to see that the practices that give you more uh, output, but that's made possible by the much better developed root systems. Okay, next. This is a, a field from Bihar, India. SWI, system of wheat intensification on the left, and then the conventional growth on the right. The field on the right is quite good, but you see the field on the left is about two weeks ahead in this growth cycle, and also will give, give a higher yield. So uh, farmers can be quite rewarded by the effort it takes to do SWI uh, uh, in Bihar. Next. This picture is from Mali. And you see the difference in the panicles of wheat between the conventional growth broadcasting on the right and the transplanted seedlings on the left. Okay, next. This is sugarcane in India grown with SRI methods, the sustainable sugarcane intensification a method that Bikshan Guja and his colleagues have worked on uh, spread this myth because sugarcane is a crop that uses a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer, but you can cut both the water and fertilizer with SSI and you see some magnificent growth from the plants. I don't need to give you numbers when you can look and see the differences in the plants like this. More tillers, thicker tillers, stronger tillers, higher rice or sugar recovery rates in the milling, uh, many advantages to that. Next. This is the grain crop in Ethiopia, teff, which is their indigenous grain crop. On the left, you see a father and his son holding up a STI and a conventionally grown broadcasted teff plant. Teff seeds are about the size of mustard seeds. They're very, very tiny, which is why it never occurred to anyone to transplant them. But it turns out if you transplant them widely, giving a lot more space, you can get the kind of profuse growth that's seen on the right. Next. This is in Sierra Leone where uh, Gerald Aruna, one of our SR colleagues has been growing green leafy vegetables with SRI ideas, transplanting young seedlings widely spaced he gets 10 times more yield from these little beds than when they broadcast uh, the uh, crying crying seeds on, this, on a similar area. It's carefully managed, but if you can get 10 times more yield, it's well worth the effort. Next. And this picture is from the state of Maine up in the far northeast of the US near Canada, uh, Mark Fulford, an organic farmer there has taken up SRI ideas and applied them to his carrots. You see the carrot bed on the uh, left and you see the harvest. He gets more than three times the profitability because virtually all the carrots produced with his 
wide, in this case, it's direct seed, but wide spacing, not transplanting. But he gets higher price because it's all grade A carrots, plus he gets more carrots. You see just the quality of the crop there. And he's tried to apply these ideas in his orchard to apple growing. And he sent me this picture of one of the branches of his apple trees with uh, adjustments toward organic fertilizer, wider spacing, careful pruning at the right time of the growing season. Uh, you make quite a few changes when you go from a field crop to a tree crop, but the basic principles, the basic ideas still have validity of the crop is different as apples. Next. So SRI is more than certain practices. There are basic principles that underlie SRI practice. First, establish the plants early, quickly, carefully. Avoid trauma to the roots as they are the source of growth. That's a principle which applies certainly to rice, but also other crops as well. Maintain low plant density. Optimize the development of each individual plant and minimize the competition for nutrients, water, and sunlight. Now the first one applies to the first practice, second is to the second and third practices. Uh, third principle applies to the fourth and fifth practices I showed you before. Reduce and control the application of water. Provide only as much water as necessary to meet the needs of the plants and the organisms. Maintain mostly aerobic soil conditions, and that's uh, practices four and five. As I said before, no flooding equals passive soil aeration. Mechanical weeding equals active soil aeration plus green manuring. Next. Then the next one is enrich the soil with organic matter to improve soil structure and functioning and to improve water holding capacity. Also support the aerobic microbial life uh, which has many beneficial services we can talk about if you like, and provide good substrate for the roots, which corresponds to the six practices I mentioned. These first four are ones which Father Lani himself in his writings sort of pointed to as the reasons why the specific practices were productive. Uh, I'm sure you would agree, however, with these other two I've added. One is to elicit more productive and robust phenotypes from any given genotype. Uh, the genetic traits are important, but our task as farmers or growers, producers, is to capitalize on the potentials that are in the crop plants and the soil systems. So the trick, if there is a trick, is to elicit uh, this potential, which are, is there for the taking. And then the sixth I add is to think ecologically particularly to pay attention to the plant soil microbial complexes. And as I said, these principles apply similarly to other crops beyond rice. So these are the principles which correspond to uh, the practices which I went over before. Next. This is a picture sent from Madagascar. This is a traditional variety of rice and, uh, but grown with SRI practices. And you can see, of course, the pleasure on the farmer's faces, but just think about those huge, heavy panicles not falling over. The plant is robust enough, strong enough. The stalks are resistant to bending and breaking. And so this was measured as a 17 ton yield. I can't vouch for that myself. That's what the technician calculated. But even that was only 10 tons with the traditional variety which usually commands a higher price in the market because consumers prefer the texture and taste and aroma of uh, indigenous varieties usually uh, being quite a success for the farmer. Okay, next. This is a picture which was sent uh, from Bihar by Anil uh, from the farm of Sumant Kumar, a farmer in Darvishpur, a village of Bihar who had an incredible crop this year. Uh, the measured yield by the technicians from the Department of Agriculture was 22.4 tons per hectare, which was clearly a world record. Uh, 
many people will want to challenge that. Uh, in fact, this is done with the standard measures, a five meter by 10 meter plot in the middle of the field, harvested and then weighed and then calculated what would be the uh, yield for, per hectare. Again, look at the panicles on that rice. What's also important is that four other farmers in the same village had yields over 19 tons per hectare with SRI methods that season. Um, I should mention this was with a hybrid variety of rice uh, and also that they did integrated nutrient management where they provide a little bit of phosphorus and potassium, uh, but mostly the uh, soil nutrition, plant nutrition came from organic sources. Next. This is a plant which I was given by farmers in Indonesia, Eastern Java in 2009. And I put this on as an example of how the phenotypic expression of genetic potential can play out. This stump of rice was a modern variety. Uh, Chiharang is a modern variety grown under SRI management. This has 223 tillers, a massive root growth you can see, grown from a single seed. Now, not all seeds will do that. You know, you have to really get all the growing conditions right. But in this case, the plant just took off. I couldn't bring it back to the United States because of our regulations, but I could take a picture uh, and I say, I I've seen this plant, I, I know it exists. And the farmers, of course, were very proud of that. And they, 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 they were rewarded for their efforts. Next. This is a graph produced by a researcher at the China National Rice Research Institute in Hangzhou, where they compared the weight of different uh, plant organs to different stages of maturation, um, uh, comparing the same variety of rice with, uh, with uh, SRI methods or control or check methods. Um, What's interesting to see is how the purple, the panicle just explodes when you initial heading, heading, uh, full heading, milky rice, waxy rice, yellow rice, mature rice. Uh, from the full heading stage, it just expands. You also see how the yellow area, which represents the uh, sinaster, dead and dying parts of the plant starts at one stage earlier and is greater. Um, and the overall growth of the plant, talking about like uh, 160 uh, versus uh, over, over 250 with SRI plant. There's a, and also the uh, um, amount of uh, nutrients that go into the grain as a percentage of total plant biomass is much greater in SRI plants uh, versus control plants. Again, this is done quite independently by researchers at China National Rice Research Institute, sort of like the Erie for, for China, uh, a huge institution, much bigger than Erie in fact. And this is done by a researcher who was a plant physiologist who was curious about what the effects uh, were on the, the plant's growth. So that's why he took a sample of both SRI grown and conventionally grown plants. And at these six different stages, took a, 10 plants from each of the sets and then weighed the, uh, the tillers, panicle leaves. He didn't look at the roots, but he did do another study of the roots. I don't have that uh, slide here, but also showed how the roots were much deeper and larger on the SRI plants compared to the controls, okay? Next. Now, to go beyond or to, under, uh, to, to look at the, uh, or beyond or underlying SRI practices and principles is SRI philosophy. So I tried to boil this down to a few which might be of interest, especially to those who already know a lot about SRI but might not have thought about this. The first principle for SRI is empiricism. In one of his writings, Father Launier said, the rice plant is my teacher, Momet. In French, 
which means my master. I, you know, I learn from the plant. What does it need? What does it respond to? And again, if we're not empirical, we're doing an injustice to farmers and their families because we have to stay very close to the ground, to the truth, to the biological and physical realities. And so learning from the plant rather than from all the journals and articles is I think a good starting point. I'd like to quote Yogi Berra, who's a well, I call him a well-known American philosopher. Those who know American baseball know he's a very famous catcher in for the New York Yankees, an all-star for many years. He said, you can observe a lot by just watching. And uh, that stuck with me. You can observe a lot by just watching. Watch, observe, observe. Yes, we need to measure. But measurement is no substitute still for observation, which is the first step in virtually all of our science. And I also want to add to that, false negatives can be as wrong and harmful as false positives. Most of you have probably have had some statistics in your education in the past and learned about false negatives and false positives. A false negative is rejecting an idea when actually it's true rather than accepting a false idea, which is false. And so we have a lot of emphasis in our scientific work on weeding out false positives. Don't say anything is true when it's not. But also we should also take care that we don't reject something which is actually correct. And with SRI, we've found many, many scientists, with, you know, years of experience, uh, wonderful you know, academic training, rejecting SRI without one thing, without ever going to a field and looking at it without ever talking to farmers to get their observations. But the SRI has been held back for a number of years by the false negatives of scientists who rejected it, when in fact it is correct. And there is, thanks to the work of many of you, uh, there's been a growing body of evidence published in the literature showing that the change in phenotype is indeed attainable. Secondly, as a principle, I'd say human is humanism, putting farmers' interests first. Uh, and one of the things which Father Don Yee did was try to seek minimum independence on external inputs. Farmers often had no access to inputs. They didn't have the money uh, to buy them if they had access in Madagascar. So Father Don Yee tried to develop improvements empirically based in rice production that were based uh, upon farmers' own inputs. Now, we're not against all use of external inputs, but we encourage experimentation, innovation to be sure that in fact the uh, practices being undertaken or promoted are in farmers' benefit. Uh, SRI includes efforts to develop people, not just grow more rice. The name Tevi Saina, which was chosen by Father Lalaunier and his uh, colleagues, Tefi Saina means improve the mind, or improve the mentality, not grow more rice. And so the purpose of all this is to make for greater human security, uh, greater human well being. And also, it means that we promote and use participatory methods. I call this farmer centered research and development. Uh, ISNAR, one of the CGIR centers, uh, I had some time ago a monograph on the triangular method, not the linear method where you have scientists to research to extension agents to farmers, but the farmers at the end of a delivery system, but a triangular model where researchers, extension people and farmers are like three corners of a triangle. Everyone communicates with everyone else. And I want to emphasize that you can promote SRI in a linear way, you know, research to extension to farmer, but we prefer a interactive triangular model where farmers and researchers, extension people are all together. The research, the extension people in the system become in many ways facilitators and catalysts. Uh, 
encouragers. Uh, and so uh, the humanism is a strong underlying principle, which is not just a matter of uh, plant physiology or morphology or genetics, but rather has its grounding in the commitment to uh, best human outcomes from this the next. Environmentalism, there's a strong philosophical engagement with and commitment to environmentalism, respecting the natural environment, protecting and conserving it. I said, nurture nature <laughs> rather than exploit nature. Uh, certainly Father Lamy had that principle. I think those of you who've worked with SRI for some many years also have that as a philosophical commitment uh, to respect and promote and conserve the environment. Uh, then I added two things which are, I think, philosophical. One is to understand that less can produce more. Don't assume that we always expend more to get more, which is the way that benefit cost analysis works. How much do you spend to get even more back? In fact, with SRI, you can spend less to get more, which makes a benefit cost ratio nonsense because it comes out as infinity. Um, but the idea of being conserving of resources, not just pile on more, which is our sort of instinctive reaction. And this principle really unders or undergirds or supports environmentalism as a principle or philosophy because. Uh, if we're going to be able to have a planet where nine or 10 billion people can live securely and productively, we're going to have to figure out many ways of producing less more, or more value with less input, and less expenditure, less consumption of resources. So I put that as a, a philosophical principle. And then I also toss in the notion of postmodern agriculture which I call the most modern agriculture. Uh, this is, all of you have been told, modern agriculture is better than traditional agriculture. Traditional agriculture is backward. SRI is really traditional agriculture, warmed over. In fact, we say SRI and SCI are postmodern, that we're trying to go beyond what's now called modern agriculture, taking a scientific approach, but also a democratic or participatory educated approach, which is more in keeping with the 21st century than I think uh, the modern agriculture was, which produced many benefits in the 20th century. I don't want to you know, argue about that or argue against uh, what's been done in the past, but say it's no longer the most appropriate for what conditions that we have in the 21st century. Next. So what's needed? Uh, I'll just go over these quickly. First of all, I think we did a paradigm shift for agriculture, and I characterize this as agroecology, which includes not just SRI, but also IPM, agroforestry, conservation farming, etc. cetera. Uh, we need to understand and work with the soil biota better. And I've been very pleased in the last 10 years to work with Chinese and Malaysian and Nepali colleagues on this, uh, that for SRI to achieve its potential, we need to understand how soil organisms uh, facilitate plant growth, plant health. Uh, and uh, February Donny is with us today. February's done some really path-breaking work on this. Uh, and the Chinese research I refer to is work done uh, at the Institute of Botany in the China Academy of Sciences uh, where they've shown very clearly, and invited me to help them write it up, uh, that beneficial bacteria, in this case, certain strains of rhizobacteria, uh, if they enter the plant through the roots and uh, uh, migrate up the stems of the plant into its leaves and so forth, they are actually going to affect the plant's expression of their genes. And so there's very clear evidence published in the journal Plant Microbial Biology 
showing that microbes uh, affect plants' gene expression. So they're not just the genes and the seed when we put in the soil, but it's what the plants do with that once they get uh, inhabited by microorganisms. Uh, we should stress organic matter, improving the means to reduce, acquire, process, and apply organic matter to build up soil systems. If you think about it, I would think we probably haven't even spent 1% as much money on organic matter production and management as we have with fertilizer development and application. It's been at least a 100 to 1 ratio of expenditure on fertilizer development and use compared to organic matter development and use. We're still using really centuries old tools to cut down biomass, uh, very old practices to compost it. We don't have good uh, simple wheelbarrows or wagons for moving organic matter about. Um, so figuring out the ways to both produce and then acquire and process and apply organic matter is a great need. Water control is also a great need because water is becoming scarcer and more valuable. Uh, we should be making investments, both hardware facilities and software organization to be able to control water more precisely, not just SRI, but all the SCI methods also try to use water very carefully, uh, sparingly, but also in very productively. As I mentioned, uh, Amod Docker's research has shown that we can probably save even more water if we have more uh, control over the water. And then a sixth need, fifth need, excuse me, is mechanization to reduce labor requirements to make agriculture work less burdens and unhealthy. We're already getting a lot of innovations bubbling up in many countries. The most uh, impressive ones so far are coming from Pakistan. Next. This is a eight hectare field in the Punjab province of Pakistan. It's been laser leveled. Uh, our colleague Asif Sharif, uh, who is a very large scale farmer has his own uh, workshop for mechanization. He was able to design or adapt uh, machinery so that he can make raised beds here, uh, uh, 45 inches across about 10 inch height. Uh, and so this is made on a laser level field. Next. He designed this uh, vehicle, which is multi-purpose, where the laborers, instead of stooping over, sit in the uh, vehicle and ride it, dropping 10 day seedlings into holes of the machine as the can will be punched into the beds. So they get very precise spacing 22 and a half by 22 and a half centimeters. And there's a big tank of water you see there, the Bowser, which uh, puts the water into the hole after the seedling has been dropped into it. So that then the, it has water to survive until the whole field has been transplanted in a few hours. They flood it to one inch over the uh, top of the raised beds. Uh, and uh, that's enough to get the rice plants started growing. After that, they just do furrow irrigation along these furrows in between the raised beds. It's a very intensive, very capital intensive, labor sparing uh, methodology. Next. <clears throat> and he has a mechanical weeder that can operate without even a driver. It's done by radio control and it goes down and it breaks up the soil in between the plants. You see how that's done. Uh, next. This innovation produced three times the typical yield and pushes out 12 tons per hectare instead of four tons per hectare with 70% less water and 70% less labor. Uh, it has however high capital costs as you can see. Uh, and I'll see if it's found it more profitable to grow wheat and maize, sugarcane, carrots, potatoes, a variety of things. We has developed a mechanized SCI uh, 
But we also are having many other examples of mechanization for rice, simple weeders, simple transplanters. This is an area where we're just getting started, but we have to do a lot more work in the coming years to be able to reduce the labor requirements, not only just for economic purposes, but remember that rice growing is one of the most physically demanding uh, activities you can have. Uh, some terrible cases of how women spending a lifetime in weeding, transplanting uh, rice have deformed and, and twisted spines. So they can't even walk normally anymore. And so making this less burdensome, uh, less uh, unwholesome uh, should be one of our goals as well because humanistic agriculture is part of SRI message. Anyway, I'll end with just three concluding thoughts and then I'll be glad to have any questions or response or objections you'd like to have. First, it's pretty obvious, but we need to be thinking outside the box. We need to be thinking beyond what we've always done. Uh, I think Einstein said, you know, you won't solve problems by using the same thinking that got you those problems in the first place. And SRI throughout its 30 year history has been an example of outside the box thinking. You can get you know, better rice production by not flooding your fields. You can get better rice production by reducing your plant population by 80 or 90%. These really made no sense, but they were tested empirically and empiricism validated them. Also, I want to emphasize that both SRI and SCI are still work in progress. They're not finished yet and probably never will be finished. Uh, we make it a very uh, clear point to emphasize that you know, we welcome innovation, adaptations, changes, challenges. Uh, we should never get complacent or self-satisfied with this. We should keep our minds open uh, and uh, be making improvements when and where we can. And then third is the conclusion that came out of our first and so far only international conference in SRI in 2002 in Sanya, China, that we should walk on both legs. Now, some of you will know that was a slogan of Mao Zedong when he was asked whether to emphasize industrial development or agricultural development and Mao's answer was walk on both legs. And what we said at the Sanya conference was both research and practice, uh, practical applications are needed together, not in sequence. The usual model for technological advance has been, you know, develop the science, develop the knowledge, convert it into technology, and then take it to the farmers, get the farmers to do it. Uh, at the conference, we had both researchers and NGO and other practitioners, including some farmer practitioners. Uh, and we agreed that these are both needed at the same time, not in sequence. And so we find the experience enriches science much as science can enrich experience. So we don't want a conflict between science and practice. Rather, we say that what we're doing is as scientifically developed as, and justified as we can make it, but we also won't reject practice which is successful just because someone says, aha, uh -huh, scientists don't support that, don't improve that. Well, let's go test it, let's be empirical. So anyway, these are enough comments to start the uh, discussion. I'm sorry it took a little longer than I thought, but I always like to add uh, some observations. I very much like to have questions and I guess Eliza has been collecting them, is that right? I like Debashi's comment there, by the way. Yes, let's emphasize principles. And when you're training for SRI, don't just tell people what to do, but why they should be doing it, why it will be beneficial for them so they can then understand what's behind the thinking and feel more comfortable making adaptations and adjustments. Eliza, over to you. Okay, bro. Thank you very much for the sharing. Okay. So I would like to uh, have, uh, they have some questions in the chat box. I will read to you. Okay. Um, 
they have a Rapula Mahindra, I think. Uh, he asked yeah, I'm about- sorry, I'm not hearing you, Eliza. Okay. Uh, the question from Rapulo, Rapulo uh, he's asked about how to make this technology as national policy. How can these, try it again. Uh, how to make this technology as national policy? Well, there are some things which governments presently do that are unhelpful for agroecology generally or SRI specifically, uh, continued government subsidies for fertilizer, for instance, are very pernicious. Uh, they reduce water quality, soil health, and uh, in fact, we've been able to show that you can get even more production with these agroecological methods. So you can focus on specific things like um, you know, fertilizer subsidies. That would be my first one. But I don't think that this, this change is going to come because someone at the top decides is right and tries to dictate it. I think that insofar as this is a humanistic and empirical enterprise, uh, an environmental enterprise, is something that we are changing as a kind of spirit of the times, a zeitgeist. Uh, the results we can now publish, the results we can show in the pictures. I made this presentation very visual because SRI is a visual subject. You should see what the effects are and then try to calibrate and measure as best you can. Um, I think the researchers and NGOs, others uh, could focus on maybe the, the barriers, impediments, but trying to mandate and require agroecological practices, for example, I think that's going against the philosophy of SRI. One thing we haven't yet done as much of as we could is to make SRI also a farmer to farmer enterprise. There's nothing very complicated or ex exotic uh, or esoteric about SRI. Farmers can and do teach other farmers. And so I would design our extension programs as one where you have uh, lead farmers or uh, model farmers, perhaps. Well, the purpose is once they've been able to show it in their fields, they should be explaining it to others. Uh, we've been, I've been very impressed myself, find how many farmers, in fact, once they are doing SRI successfully, take their own time and effort to uh, uh, dis disseminate it themselves. Uh, Prema Ratna in uh, Sri Lanka, and set up a little sort of uh, kiosk around his SRI field where he would have benches and a blackboard for 10 to 15 farmers who would be making trips to come and, and see what he could do. Uh, May Som in Cambodia, who was the first SRI farmers in that country because he was elderly himself anyway, and his children were doing most of the farming, would take two rice plants, a conventional rice plant in one hand SRI plant in the other and just walk into other villages and engage farmers there in conversation uh, and say, here's, you know, this is one I grew, I grew both of these, one with SRI methods, one with conventional methods, look at the difference. So I think that uh, rather than rely upon the governments to be promoting this, uh, we should be doing what we can, I think, to get this as a farmer effort, working with farmer associations, farmers unions, whatever. Now, as this happens also, of course, the incentives for governments to get on board will also increase as they see that farmers are adopting, benefiting, uh, they'll want to be on the side of uh, successful methods. So um, even though I'm a political scientist originally, uh, I don't spend much time thinking about how to, you know, get governments to play a better role. There are good examples in Cambodia for a while and there was a favorable minister. Uh, the gov state government in Bihar played a tremendously positive role, which uh, Anil can tell you more about, but they did it because of the work that he and his colleagues had done to show the good results. And so then the politicians were getting on board uh, rather than being persuaded as a starting point for SRI. And others may have their thoughts on this. Uh, 
Those are my thoughts. Thank you, bro. For the next questions from Adam Aziz, asks about, are there any challenges in training farmers on the SRI, especially in developing countries? Are there one? Are there any challenges in training farmers on SRI, especially in developing countries? Well, we've had difficulty getting much attention in developing countries because SRI is developed in Madagascar, initially at least, requires more labor. And labor is the big constraint for agriculture in, the, in almost everywhere, but particularly in developed countries. Um, but essentially, we have uh, been cooperating, assisting uh, experiments in the south of the United States where uh, a foundation is trying to help black farmers who have been reduced in number by 75% over the last 30 years, helping them to stay, keep their farms, uh, stay in agriculture. And we're using uh, SRI as a means to raise their profitability of farming. It's interesting that the uh, organic farmer up in Maine, whose carrots and apples I showed you, is again on his own time uh, going down uh, to the Delta, Mississippi Delta, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, to share with uh, farmers there his knowledge of how to use SRI ideas. And particularly, he's very knowledgeable about small scale mechanization. And so he's helping them with that. Uh, but I haven't seen any examples of, there is a farmer in Holland who's using SWI methods very successfully. Um, in general, the, in, in developed countries, once we had opposition from the International Rights Research Institute, ERI, they sort of tuned out. And since uh, our most greatest interest was in helping uh, the more disadvantaged to uh, improve their production and security, we haven't spent much time uh, with farmers in the more developed countries. I'm told that there, I read, there are some immigrants from the Gambia and West Africa now using SRI methods in the Hudson River Valley in New York State, not too far from Cornell, but I haven't been down to visit them. Okay, Prof. Uh, uh, the question from Prasad. He asks, uh, can an assessment be made on the water seed wasted in crop cultivation by water intensive practices over three decades? Can you give me that one again? Uh, can an assessment be made on water seed wasted in crop cultivations by water intensive practices over three decades? I still haven't understood it. Can anyone else mm. say it more clearly? Uh, can an assessment be made on the water, seed wasted in crop cultivations by water intensive practices over three decades? Hmm. Well, certainly water use and water productivity can be assessed. Uh, two Indian students doing their degrees at Cornell did a meta-analysis of all the published research on SRI and water management a couple of years ago, which you know is on our website. I could send it to anyone interested. Uh, and they document even when the SRI was probably not being done very well on research stations, that the yields were increased with a 23% reduction average on total water per hectare and a 35% less irrigation water per hectare across 29 studies in eight countries. Um, okay, uh, the next is uh, the questions from uh, Paddy Grint. Uh, he asks about how many times the SRI rice got harvested and how does, uh, how to manage on the pest problem. Okay, can you read, the, read that again then? Uh, how many times the SRI uh, rice got harvested a year and how do you manage the pests? How many times does rice SRI rice get harvested 
Yes, yeah. and after a year. And, and, how, year, to, and how to manage the pests? Well, in terms of pest management, that's the easier one to answer. Uh, you manage them as best you can by growing the plants in more fertile soil without excess water, spacing enough so that the uh, plant density is reduced, which all in itself will reduce many kinds of pests and disease problems. In general, we find that pests and diseases are reduced with SRI methods. So there's very little or even no need for chemical pesticides. Um, uh, Debbie Donnie's work, for instance, showed that sheath blight was uh, greatly resisted if you could inoculate. The, if you use SRI, sheath blight was reduced. If you inoculated the seedlings with uh, trichoderma uh, and these conventional methods, it was reduced. If you did both SRI methods and trichoderma inoculation, there was an even greater reduction in sheath blight. Again, for pest diseases, it's usually a matter of economizing or optimizing, uh, not necessarily reducing to zero, but reducing to a level where you know, the losses don't uh, wipe out the gains that you get or, or the losses wouldn't compensate for the added cost of using chemical controls. But a, a farmer's report all over, you know, many, many countries, and we have probably about a dozen studies now showing that SRI methods in themselves will reduce the crop's vulnerability or susceptibility to pests and diseases. Okay, um, the, the next question is, is there any success story of harvesting from returned SRI, harvesting twice from single planting? We're talking about harvest, you're talking about, ratoon, about ratooning, uh, getting two harvests from the same planting? Yes. This is an area again where I should have mentioned that there's experimentation to be done. I first learned about this from a letter from a, a Canadian missionary in Peru who was trying SRI out in the edges of the Amazon region of Peru. And he found that they got about 60% uh, but got a second harvest from letting the rice regrow and then harvest it of, of, with SRI methods. Uh, there's some work that's been done in the Philippines um, and Indonesia. Uh, Iswande Anas has done some work with ratooning in Indonesia, but we don't have enough evidence on this yet uh, to make strong recommendations. I encourage people to try it, to leave their uh, crop uh, after they harvest it the first time, let it regrow, saving all the cost and all the effort of growing seedlings and transplanting. Uh, the thing is that if you've used SRI methods in the first season, the roots will have grown very strong and deep and the plant can very quickly and successfully recover its growth uh, and, and give that uh, second crop. Iswande in Indonesia had some second crops that even were more productive than the first because of the large root growth but we haven't made very much in this because there hasn't been as much systematic research. Anyone who wants to work on this, please get in touch with me by email and we can talk about how to test and, and report on this. Okay, Prof, they have a question from Prasad. Uh, he asked about how do you suggest pushing agroecological research, which is fundamentally cyclical Cyclic, cyclical than linear. Didn't get that at first. Try it again. How do you suggest pushing agroecological research, which is fundamentally cyclical than linear? Or maybe, yes. or maybe uh, uh, Prasad, you can uh, unmute and you can ask. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, can you hear me, Professor? Yes, Paul? I hear you very well. <laughs> okay, uh, Bob, uh, thanks for the presentation first. But I was uh, raising two points, which you are very close to your heart. One is soil biology, mm -hmm. emphasis on soil biology. And the second thing is emphasis on cyclical research when you are pursuing the agroecological research paradigm. It's no longer linear research. So how do we push the agenda of thinking cyclical or triangular, whatever you have said about mm -hmm. ISNR approach, which is fundamentally necessary for agroecological research, which is complex mm -hmm. and not linear. So what is your comment and what is your suggestion for the research institutions to pursue that alternative paradigm? And that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure uh, what kind of answer would be uh, helpful on that. Um, Again, when research is being done, uh, in general, I prefer that it be done in farmers' fields with farmers' cooperation uh, so they can be learning along with the researcher as to what is there. Um, I think that the scientific community should be more willing to accept that kind of data. Oftentimes it gets rejected out of hand saying, oh, that was controlled enough um, the fact is on research stations, you can have control and have maybe more rigorous analysis, but not more realistic analysis. And I, if I have to choose between realistic and rigorous analysis, the realistic analysis should win. Uh, one thing we found very early was that when research is done on experiment stations with SRI methods, they usually get poor results than the farmers even sometimes you know, a few hundred meters away. Uh, we've not had any studies to demonstrate this, but I'm quite certain this is because in the experiment station plots, they've been using chemical fertilizers on all kinds of biocides, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, luscicides, <laughs> uh, which have affected the soil life. At Erie, when uh, uh, our manager asked me in 2004 why I thought they didn't get the same yields that farmers did with SRI methods. I said, I haven't done any studies, but I think your soils are almost dead. And he looked at me very surprised, but I had to concede that probably they were, I mean, it's interesting that we had several dozen farmer results already from SRI in the Philippines that averaged six tons. The first time Erie tried SRI method, they had 1.2 ton, which is almost impossible. The second time they got three ton yields, but only half what farmers are getting. And I said, I think that you have to consider what is the status of your soils. But that isn't quite, quite answering your question yet. Um, I guess I say that, that all the research should factor in the biological element now even if, you're, if, even if you're doing a, a plant morphology or physiology study, you should be considering that microorganisms are going to be affecting uh, whatever results you're appearing. It isn't just the nutrients that you put in the soil. It isn't just the soil type. It's what's living in the soil system. So uh, um, I, I would encourage us all to, to, to reorient our thinking in that direction so whenever, you know, when you sit, we had a move in the US saying, thank a plant today. And I wanted a bumper sticker to say, and thank all the microorganisms that go with it. When I look at a plant now, I try to imagine if I can't see what is the life in the soil and all the microorganisms that are on and even inside the plant itself. Just as humans depend upon what we call the microbiome uh, we're getting more and more evidence that the plant microbiome is really essential for its success. And that plant breeding has really been uh, mistaking a lot of the effects they see, uh, attributing them to the genes that they're manipulating, when in fact they should be attributing them to the organisms that are on in and around the plant. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prasad.
Okay, now we have another 10 more minutes. Maybe we can have a question from the audience, from ladies and gentlemen. If you have the question, you can unmute your uh, microphone and you can ask uh, our speakers. We have the questions from the audience. Also, let me uh -huh. just add that uh, for those of you who don't have questions answered today are all welcome to email me and raise your question and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. My email address is ntu1, Norman Thomas above one, ntu1 at Cornell, C-O-R-N-E-L-L -L dot E-D-U. Very simple. It's not N-T-U-L, it's N-T-U-1. Uh, some people made that mistake. Uh, but uh, I'm very happy to uh, be interacting with any and all of you that are curious about SRI. And if you have any experience to share good or bad, uh, do share that. I always like to say we learn often more from our bad experience than a good experience. So don't, don't try just to tell the good stories. Uh, if you have problems, let's get them ahead. Hey, uh, got can I speak? Yeah, sure, sure. Yes. Uh, Namaskar, uh, Upafti. This is Mahendra Kumar from Indian Institute of Rice Research, Hyderabad. Uh, I, I think you remember me. And, oh, very well. Uh, good evening from India. And uh, my still one clarification I wanted to make uh, get from you that still can we try indigenous cult uh, cultivars uh, on SRI, which definitely will yield better better than the normal cultivation. Do you have any experiences from other other countries? Totally indigenous, which are not evolved by the scientists. Farmers varieties, what I'm talking. Which are very less tillering and uh, they yield very less. But uh, you have any come across any uh, anything from other countries or anything. So we wanted to do some some efforts on, I think uh, we are starting to do some efforts on the indigenous varieties, how they respond for SRA country. Well, I think if we want to have empirical studies on this and we shouldn't go by the uh, literature as to which is a, a low tilling, which is a high tilling variety. I remember my visit to Andhra Pradesh. Uh, I think I saw you on that trip when uh, our friend Alapati Satya Narayana uh, pointed out that the very popular Indian rice variety, Sarna, had been considered as a low tillering variety under conventional methods, but with SRI, you have 80, 90 tillers. And so the tillering potential of a plant uh, is not fixed in its genes. It's the action of the genes with the environment that determines how tillering it will be and so although you want a variety which is responsive to SRI methods with profuse tillering, you shouldn't assume that just because a variety has been characterized as low tillering under conventional management, there will also be low tillering under SRI management. It could be, but that's an empirical question. My favorite response usually is that's an empirical question. Let's test it. Because the fact is that uh, biology is lots of surprises for us still. Uh, biological means not mechanical. It's not mechanistic. It's not predetermined. Uh, it means there's potential that can be en uh, elicited, enhanced by the right kind of growing conditions. And so uh, my answer usually is, you know, again, if, if I'm a farmer starting out, I will try three or four different kinds of varieties in my field to see which are actually responsive, not just to SRI methods, but methods under the soil, climate, topography conditions that the plants are in. Uh, and we may be surprised. We may not be. It may just confirm what we thought we knew, but these are empirical matters. So we should be uh, testing them out. Uh, for information of Naman, now what we are shifting towards totally mechanizing, even uh, direct feeding also totally mechanization mm. and following with all SRI principles. 
we are we are really getting very good yields we are working with more than 20000 farmers totally converting them to direct cd and also we are practicing totally mechanization whole whole practices are mechanized and it is really very very interesting and they are, uh, the farmers are getting very good uh, uh, yields also and benefit cost ratio is much more higher when we are going for direct cd with sri practices now, i think that's right that uh, as i said before labor Availability, labor costs are a problem many places. And I think that we will move to uh, direct seeding with SRI spacing, soil management, water management. And it may not be the highest yields, but it will give the highest economic returns. And if in fact we're doing the other methods right, it may well be that the direct seeding will still surpass what conventional can achieve with uh, transplanting. Uh, there are a number of mechanical transplanters, which of course are being developed. Uh, and they seem to be fairly successful. Uh, there's research done recently in Pakistan by Farhan Khalid uh, on seed priming, which is to soak the seeds before you sow them in a solution. Uh, usually, I guess it's potassium chloride, uh, but it could be other chemicals as well, which will help to prime the seed for a higher rate of germination, which is what the problem with direct seeding is you don't know if germination will be 100%. In fact, it won't be 100%. So if you sow a seed bed and transplant seedlings, you know you have gotten the germination. But I think that we're going to be able with priming perhaps, uh, with good research on soil preparation, uh, with good design of mechanical seeders to get a very high germination rate and the fact is that if, if one seed doesn't germinate, the plants around it will usually grow more profusely to fill in that space to take advantage of the solar radiation. Uh, when people are doing SRI and square planting, they say, should I fill in, do gap filling, fill in any place where the seedling didn't grow. And unless that's more than about 5%, don't bother. The fact is that the plants, the four plants around it will grow into that open space uh, because of their flexibility, uh, their plasticity. And so you, you might lose a little bit, but it wouldn't be worth the expense and effort of trying to wade out in the field and fill in a gap here and there. Uh, if you get more than 5%, 10%, then you might even want to reseed. And again, with SRI, because it takes so little time to grow seedlings, uh, replanting is actually a option if in fact you have enough water. Okay, thank you very much, Pro. Now we add, uh, we uh, left in one minute, 10 30. Okay, I think uh, I should uh, close the sessions for today. So I would like to uh, say thank you to our speaker. Uh, for sharing uh, about the SRI and uh, SCI. Okay, I also uh, uh, now I I, I also uh, increase my knowledge about the SRI and the SCI. Thank you very much, and also thank you very much to the our audi uh, audience. Okay, we also have the uh, audience in our YouTube and our uh, Facebook. And for your information, our audience is. Uh, from all over the world, okay, from Turkey, from India, from Thailand, Japan, US, um, UK, all right? Okay, thank you very much for your support. So if you have any question uh, to our speaker today, you can um, directly uh, email to him as we already shared the uh, email address in the chat box, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just to remind you, uh, kindly uh, fill the attendance link as uh, we already share the uh, link in the chat box. Okay, Prof, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so uh, happy to have you as our speaker. All right, hope we can uh, hope we can see again, maybe face to face. I'd be glad to. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you to uh, Kadir in Iraq, who I notice is uh, tuned in as well. So we have Iraq represented in the program today. 
I can't tell how many others because I can only see about 20 of you at a time. <laughs> and we have 100 uh, participants in Zoom and we have uh, approximately uh, 50 participants in our YouTube and also in our Facebook. Mm -hmm. Are we taking yeah. a group photograph, Elisa? Uh, I think wait, wait a moment. For the record? Yeah, we can, uh, we can, uh, everybody can open the camera and we can uh, take the photograph. Thank you. Uh, wait a moment. Okay, uh, we have uh, wait, the second screen. We have four screen. Huh? Right. Uh, the second screen. One, two, three. Okay. This while. Okay, and we have the third screen. And we will have the last screen. Okay, thank you everybody. We will see you for our next webinar next month on the uh, 9th of July. We will send the information about our next webinar. Thank you so much, so much all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank all the best to all and stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. Norman, nice to see you and hope you are well. <laughs> Get well, then you can travel. Well, maybe not this year. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, from so much. I'm so sorry that we cannot accommodate everyone and um, cannot have all the questions answered. So, um, so uh, hopefully you can uh, send email directly to Prof. Norman too. Yes. Answer your question. Thank you, um, everyone. Thank you.